Uh, tonight's webinar, again, is a cooperation between SFL Germany and SFL Poland. And it is about an uh, untypical topic. Um, we are very lucky to have a lot of people in the libertarian movement who understand the importance of culture. For example, Stephen Davies is giving lectures about metapolitics. Another important figure is uh, David McCloskey. And uh, today's guest is no different. Um, uh, Dr. Hab Mateusz Machaj uh, is an economic lecturer at the Wrocław University in Poland. Uh, he is the founder of the Polish Mises Institute. I've said it before, I've, I will say it again, it's my favorite Mises Institute. And uh, he's also the chief leading economist of uh, this institute, this think tank. And uh, today he will talk with us about um, the rise and fall of the first galactic empire. So he will talk about a movie uh, which is deep in our hearts, which is very important, um, and which is actually not just a movie about lightsabers and about knights, but a deeply political movie. This uh, series, of course, is the Star Wars saga. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, welcome Mateusz Mahai uh, <laughs> to this. Hello talk. there. Hello there. Geeks and fans, good evening. I'm happy to be here. Uh, since the idea of the webinar is to engage the audience with the discussion, uh, to engage the audience uh, in the discussion with the speaker, uh, please let me just as briefly as possible introduce my, my main thoughts about the topic. And then uh, I encourage you to engage in any way possible, as much as possible uh, in the discussion. As a brief introduction, um, some of you or most of you know, I wrote this book. Uh, it's called Rise and Fall of the First Galactic, Galactic Empire, the philosophy of Star Wars, Star Wars and, and political philosophy, actually. And the reason why I wrote this book is that I was really disappointed in the existing literature. Uh, the movies, uh, especially the first six movies, uh, are about political reality. They have lots of lots of references to uh, political orders uh, and uh, to some extent even to economic orders. But I was completely dissatisfied with what, with what, what I could find uh, in the discussion uh, about those movies, about uh, in, in, in culture. We have many books about religious aspects of Star Wars, psychological aspects, but we, we, do, we really don't have the one about political philosophy. There is one or two books about philosophy in Star Wars, but it's not political enough. At least I, I didn't find it to be. And so the reason why I wrote this book is to actually fill in the Nietzsche. Uh, and some of the things, see, some of the themes that I find uh, really interesting and, and most important are, of course, the themes about the natural law. We have uh, the classic clash between the, the tradition of the natural law and um, the idea of positive law, which is treated as an end in itself. Uh, of course, Palpatine uh, or Palpatine, uh, it depends uh, which trilogy you're fan of, because in, in Amidala pronounces it actually Palpatine, but uh, it used to be pronounced Palpatine, but it was not in the older movies anyway. Uh, just a side note. <clears throat> so we have this clash of natural law and positive law or, or uh, actually morality above some legal rules as the rules of the game. Uh, this is especially developed in uh, the first, uh, in the prequels, so in the second trilogy, but in the first three movies. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, four, five, and six, on the other hand, we have the idea of social change. Now, the big difference between four, five, six, and one to three, uh, the movies, is of course, uh, well, four, five, six are better as movies, right? Uh, meaning they are better in storytelling, and the system or, or the reality is the background. So, uh, of course, this is my opinion, but also the opinion of majority of viewers um, is that you just enjoy them more because you are more engaged in uh, storytelling and uh, character development. Uh, now, uh, on, on the other hand, the, uh, philosoph the political reality is not really described that much. 
and even they didn't uh, they even did not want to go too much into the details one of the deleted scenes and and as a libertarian or just as a fan of free markets you just have to hate the fact that they deleted the scene was when Luke uh, first uh, meets his friend. Uh, you remember that in uh, New Hope, Luke meets his friend and we only witness it when he joins the army, uh, I mean the resistance, right? Whereas in the deleted scene uh, that was supposed to be in the movie, he meets his friend before and uh, he declines the offer to actually join and fight the empire. And during this discussion, we have discussion, uh, during their meeting, we have discussion between them on how the empire is nationalizing the resources and the farms. And that the empire will soon come and also uh, expropriate Luke and his family. Now, this is a really important element in Star Wars uh, universe and really important in the idea of describing how the political system works in 456. But unfortunately, they cut it out um so we lost a really really important uh, deleted scene and would add much to the story of the, how the political system is being run the same thing with uh, with the fall of the empire in the empire strikes back there is another deleted scene which is very very good where we have the um, uh, one of the leaders uh, generals of the empire army when palpatine is killed and uh, uh, vader is not responding he doesn't really know what to do. It also shows you how political systems collapse. I mean, what happens at the lower level when you don't have the authoritarian dictatorship in, on the top, how, how, how things fall. The sort of similar stuff you could see in V for Vendetta, great scene where two of the main leaders are killed and then the generals don't know what to do, whether they're supposed to shoot people or not. And uh, that was really, uh, that was actually the reward uh, scenario in, uh, for example, in Berlin Wall case when Berlin Wall collapsed. Uh, I mean, few months or weeks before it was collapsed, the soldiers on the border were ready to shoot anyone who tried to pass the Berlin Wall. Uh, but, um, but since the leadership did not give the orders and people were not sure whether uh, the, the soldiers were not sure whether the orders are supposed to be given on the same day in the media, uh, one of the representatives of the party said, well, uh, you know, people can cross the border anytime they want. So people listened to it and they actually tried to cross the border and no one shot them. But, you know, the same soldiers that were shooting uh, people, I mean, a few weeks before, then they, they just like stood there and uh, did not make a decision to uh, create a slaughter on uh, on the border. Now, of course, that was not the detail that changed, that it was not just one thing that changed and uh, led to the collapse of the Berlin Wall, but it shows you how um, uh, social psychology, so to speak, or, or um, perhaps broadly understood, sociology of ideas, how it influences how we act every day. And, and, and these small little details were in the background in 456. Then we have 1 to 3, which is at least according again to majority of viewers, the prequel trilogy is worse in terms of storytelling, but we have to say that it's way, way better in presentation of the background of the system, of the political system. We have we have really, really good uh, discussion. I mean, good relatively when you think that it's just a pop movie, right? You have really good discussion of how democracy is being run. You have good discussion how democracy is uh, uh, changing and dwarfing into authoritarianship and then totalitarian system. You have really good discussion. Uh, you have really good presentation of, uh, uh, to quote Amidala, probably the best, the best character in the first, uh, in, in the prequels. Uh, how liberty dies uh, with thunderous applause. One of the, one of my favorite lines, if, if not the favorite one in in all in all nine movies. Uh, we have also demonstration of why bureaucracy leads to destruction of democracy, and at the same time, uh, it also it's not naive. The, the the movie and the way Lucas tells us the story of democracy, he's not naive. He seems to be at least to some extent aware of the fact that democracy has its flaws and you cannot really get over them. I mean, you just cannot throw them away. Much like bureaucracy is a natural part of, um, a bureaucracy is a natural part of, of democratic system. We have also very good demonstration of Hayek's uh, concept from Constitution of Liberty. You know, there is a chapter in Constitution of Liberty on how the worst get on top in political systems. And uh, uh, Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader is a great example. I mean, many people think that uh, 
it's a badly written character that, that is, he's just really intellectu intellectually weak and he's whining all the time of course of course of course but this is how, how it's supposed to be because th these kind of people are actually brought on top by the authoritarian systems right i mean who did you expect captain planet or uh, uh, or or uh, what's his name captain america right i mean i mean it was supposed to be a sort of a weak person which is being strengthened by the by the totalitarian system and then um, by 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 palpatine himself and then there is a wonderful demonstration of uh, how society needs an enemy when you want to expand government power also greatly demonstrated by this conspiracy on part of separatists uh, of course it's a little bit uh, cliche the fact that palpatine seems to be in charge of everything it's it's a little little too far he goes lucas goes a little bit too far in this uh, in this uh, framework but he he understands i mean the relevance uh, uh, of of what actually Schmidt, uh, uh, Karl Schmidt, the, the German philosopher of the 30s, associated properly with Nazi government, who well understood that if you want to mobilize people, you have to, uh, if you want to wake up their tribal instincts to support war, to support expanding power of the government, you need enemies. And, you know, uh, when you watch elections in modern democratic systems, even if they are not trending towards uh, authoritarian systems, you will from time to time see the fact that creating an enemy or actually emphasizing that there is an enemy is important part of rhetorical political battle. We also saw this during elections in Poland. I mean, we had this uh, this um, perspective on, on finding the enemy and the enemy that has to be thought on both sides, of course, but... Um, but that 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 depends on your on your uh, personal ideas, I guess. Uh, we also have the discussion about the trade uh, element. I also like the fact that uh, war is being started in uh, in the first episode because there is a trade conflict. Um, what else? I mean, I could go on and on and on. <clears throat> I was supposed to speak shortly, so. Um, let me end with uh, one thing that I really like in the newer trilogy, because I think the newer trilogy, unfortunately, is weaker on both grounds. Uh, when you look at the first one and then the prequel one, uh, the first one, again, was about characters. The, the uh, background was the political system was in the background, not really developed in the prequel. It was the reverse. You have developed background story of political system the characters are less engaging uh, uh are not the, the the dialogue is not as good it's sort of supposed to it was supposed to be shakespearean but um it, it, it came out bizarre right uh, then we have the neutrality and uh, the recent one and we don't really have good uh, uh, storytelling either in terms of characters and we don't really have good story of the political system uh, that, that's even worse i mean it, it, we cannot really make sense of, uh, of of how the political system is being run but in The Last Jedi, Luke uh, gives us uh, the, the perfect description of the problem with the Jedi, right? So that's another thing I didn't mention about the prequels is that they de de demystify the Jedi because four, five, six episodes were presenting the Jedi as really great warriors and, and only good came out of them, whereas one to three episodes showed us that Jedi made a lot of mistakes and they were also hungry for power. I mean, not necessarily because they just wanted power for themselves, but in the political battles, they try to struggle and take as much power to themselves as possible. At one point, even Mace Windu, you remember, said that Palpatine is supposed to be killed without the due process. I mean, with, without a fair judgment and the trial, the, the trial for which, uh, which for ev everyone deserves a fair trial, even Palpatine. Come on, Mace, why did you do this? I mean, if he stayed faithful to the rules... Right. If he didn't say, OK, let's just kill him, uh, Anakin would not join the dark side. Right. Uh, so who knows how things would have ended, even if Palpatine went free and went out of the prison or somehow, you know, bribed the judges and so forth and so forth. The battle would still go on. Right. The Order 66 would not be implemented yet. And, and, and so, so who knows how things uh, would have ended if, if, it, if it was different in this case. And so Luke in the famous quotes, you know, Last Jedi, I want the Jedi to end. He says basically that all power is dangerous and uh, and and the the legacy of Jedi was a failure and he was correct in this way because they trained Darth Plagueis uh, pupil and then and, and they were also hungry for power and they thought that they owned the force 
but the force it's not something to be owned it's something external it's not controllable by any council by any entity and uh, and it basically once you have control of it becomes dangerous sort of like the rings from the lord of the rings i'll stop there thank you for listening for the slightly extended introduction and uh, please um, join me in conversation Yes, so uh, thank you for this introduction. And uh, because of, this is a webinar, we uh, are really keen uh, to discuss with you. Um, so you can ask the questions, you can make statements, you can uh, make hypotheses uh, which, uh, with which uh, we can discuss in the chat. Um, so um, we would be very happy about uh, uh, great cooperation. So um, I have a couple of questions myself. Uh, because um, I, um, I've been reading your book and um, I, I also watched um, your lecture on the topic, uh, which is available uh, on YouTube um, in Polish. And um, you are talking um, in, in great detail about uh, the philosophical uh, traditions uh, to which uh, you, can, you can adjust, you can... Um, just certain personas so for example um palpatine um and there are different traditions there you already mentioned uh legal positivism in um the contrast to natural law um, where we probably would put the jedi right um there's also uh hegelism there is also Hobbes. um how did you uh, come up with uh, while watching the movie when did you come up with this um have you you probably watched star wars as everyone um as a kid for the first time so i i doubt that uh, when you were watching it for the first time uh, you thought all right thomas Hobbes for sure um when did that happen um well actually i'm not that young you know uh I was 18 years old when uh, Phantom Menace came out, right? So I was already interested in political, well, not directly into political philosophy, but I was already interested in political ideas. And uh, um, I already was knowledgeable into uh, a lot of things about um, political thought. I was very aware of Hobbes uh, when I heard uh, Palpatine say, I will not let this republic be split in two, right? So actually, that was that was the time that was the moment when I realized. Oh, I mean, this is clearly this is clearly a Hobbesian idea. Um, I will make it legal. Uh, I think I'm not sure right now, but I think that I will make it legal even when I saw it for the first time uh, in uh, 1999. I think I, uh, yeah, I was already aware of the conflict between natural law and uh, um, and positive law. Uh, I guess it, I guess it was because of my brother. Because you see, uh, Antigone um, story that you learn in the first class of high school, right? Is the story of 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 the daughter. Uh, who tries to of the woman who who wants to bury her brother uh, after a fight, right, or during the war times, and the ruler forbids her to do so because this is what the law says, and she says that there is natural law. I mean, she doesn't use the concept, but she sort of indicates that there is natural law that allows her to bury her brother. And then you have huge conflict, right, between what is being stated by the government and also what is supposed to be done according to the moral rules. I mean, in high school, they presented sort of as a conflict between the state and the individual, which to some extent makes sense, uh, but it's deeper than that. It's not, that, it's not just that she wants to do because that's her will or something. She wants to do a thing that is a right thing to do according to the law, which is above what the government says, right? And uh, so I, uh, when I, uh, when I read this, or when maybe I didn't read this during in high school, but when I was supposed to be, <laughs> when I supposed to, when I was supposed to prepare for the class, I was talking to my brother about it, who was already studying law and was interested in political doctrines. So I had lots of discussions with him like this, on um, on the themes, on the political themes, and some of the books. 
uh, that we are supposed to read in high school. So then when, after a few years, when I was 18, I saw, okay, I will make it legal. It clicked immediately. Okay, so this guy thinks that what the government does is more important than than uh, the laws, uh, the natural laws and uh, um, uh, natural rights, sorry, than the natural rights of individuals and, and in general natural law, which is above the government law. So, so actually I was in, in, in a nice position to watch four, five, six when I was already grown up, right? It's not the same with four, five, uh, sorry, one, two, three, when I was a grown up, right? Four, five, six, yeah, yes, yeah. I was a kid, right? So I wasn't aware uh, of what was going on in there, except the fact that you have good guys and the bad guys, right? Uh, but, but one, two, three, I was already, I was already uh, acquainted uh, with a uh, with little bit of, of uh, political philosophy knowledge that allows you to spot those small details. Yes, but then again, in four, five, six, uh, you also have really the black and white side of uh, good and evil. So perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, in this case, you you were uh, very lucky when it comes to timing. Timing is important, as we all know. Yeah, um, and actually, with four, five, six, I would have to you, be, be, uh, because many of the things about mm, uh, uh, politics and political philosophy in one to three, they are easy to come about. I mean, they just shout at you uh, from time to time, right? Whereas with four, five, six, you have to dig a little bit to find those nuances that I try to squeeze out from what was in there. And uh, one idea about about uh, uh, cascading, actually, uh, I got from uh, Case Sunstein, and uh, I credit him in the chapter about it. Yeah. Yeah, mm, I would like to talk about some figures. Uh, in the movie so um, for example as we as we know there are always uh, two sifs to sif um, and uh, in the prequels um, we of course encounter um, first the unknown sif uh, Palpatine but we also um, encounter two others uh, there is uh, Count Dooku um, and um, there is um Oh god, that's embarrassing. Uh, Always forget. Darth Maul. Yes, Darth Maul. <laughs> that's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> um, you you are also talking in in the lecture um, about the differences between them, and um, you are talking about uh, how in political systems, doctrines and uh, dictatorships also there are personalities um, similar to those uh, to those people um and they are used uh, in a different way because they have different qualities uh, could you elaborate on that uh well you know darth maul is 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 a soldier um and i think that even outside of the movies he was not the sith lord uh all the time i think i mean depends which book you think about i'm not i'm i wouldn't find myself as an expert on this definitely or even or even half expert um, about the uh, books outside of it um, whereas Dooku is more of a politician uh, right so even though he's a great fighter and he's presented as such apparently better fighter than Darth Maul even though the appearance of Darth Maul seems to be you know seems to indicate Dangerous. that he's more fit right um, yeah, and, and you know I mean um, I mean, would you want to negotiate with Darth Maul, really, when you meet him? <laughs> <laughs> so, whereas with Dooku, it's different, you know, you, you realize that it's kind of like Saruman, right? I mean, it's also good, good pick, uh, good actor uh, picked for the, uh, for the role. For um, both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or both, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, I mean, it, it's also part of, Palpatine's plan. Uh, I mean, the types of characters that he chooses. Well, when you think about it, Maul was a perfect choice for the soldier. He probably could have been great Darth Vader <clears throat> uh, if if Palpatine had to stay with him and somehow managed to do everything without Anakin. Although it's hard to imagine. But even if he did, I mean, Maul would be a great, great uh, Vader. Uh, meaning, uh, I mean, the, the Vader from four, five, six, right? The guy who's supposed to introduce, uh, I mean, implement the, the the rule of fist, right? 
and um, with with Duku, he was he, he you could not substitute Duku for anyone else. You could not substitute Duku for um, for either Mall or Anakin. It had to be Duku because he had political skills to negotiate um, with separatists and to actually engage in in creation of this turmoil. And uh, so, so Duku, uh, I would compare actually Duku to more of an intellectual one, even though, again, physically he's supposed to be really strong and really good in fighting. Uh, he was also probably one of the smartest ones, very close. And he was, he was a direct, he could have been a direct competition to Palpatine, right? That's why when, when he did his job, finally, Palpatine had no problem with, with getting rid of him. He could have been a threat, whereas Anakin... I mean, there was a really, really low chance that Anakin would ever be a threat, ever. I mean, and and he w- he was never a threat as a competitor for the for the ultimate power, right? Ultimately, it turned out that Anakin was a threat, but for different reasons, right? Not because he was hungry for power to uh, to be another Palpatine. I mean, he, he could not handle it. I mean, he was happy being the bloody dwarf, right? To use the comparison to. Uh, to Stalin's um, Stalin's right hand, who was suppo- who was responsible for the terror in uh, uh, in the thirties and then beginning of the forties in uh, USSR. Yes. So uh, in that case, in that case, um, Palpatine is using different personalities with different qualities um, as keys as um, as uh, keys to his success. Um, and he needed Anakin, someone who's uh, and Vader, someone who's emotionally, very emotionally unstable, um, to reach different goals to, than with Dooku, right? Yep. Yep. I mean, be- because uh, the people like Anakin, uh, I mean, it's really easy to manipulate them. Uh, this uh, the, the, that, that that kind of person, right? Um, I actually. I actually regret, I mean, I have really good things to say about episodes one to three. Um, but, I mean, you could even go further than that. I mean, you could even make them even better. You can make them even better, right? Um, I think what would be interesting uh, for Palpatine to do, because there's this is one thing lacking, is the fact that the government, because... Palpatine is expanding his power by only doing horrible, horrible things. And this is unrealistic. Yes. Because the expanding government in reality usually is doing, is trying to do good things and does them inefficiently. And rhetorically uses uh, and demonstrates um, uh, demonstrates the programs, the government, and says, look, we have to do this. We have to expand our power in order to do this. And I would really like if Lucas uh, um, would have done the following thing. For example, uh, by using mother, Anakin's mother, as as a reason to expand further the, the the power of the government you know in order to fight slavery for example that would that would have been really politically realistic and it would show i mean anakin look i mean the republic is supposed to be efficient but you know your mother is dead she was a slave you were a slave i mean this is supposed to how it's how how um, uh, the galactic this is how galactic is supposed to be organized i mean shouldn't we do something about it you know somehow create the empire so we can introduce the local rulers who would make sure that slavery never ever happens again and that would be a really really smart thing to do but um, i guess i don't know maybe lucas did not come up with this uh with this um concept or maybe he was afraid to do it because then it would uh um create sort of a could create confusion in uh, in case of uh of the viewers much like much like the separatists are always presented as sort of negative uh in the first uh three parts right they're sort of not treated like the arguments against creation of the empire and then expansion of the empire i mean Nobody raises an argument. I mean, maybe these guys are right. Maybe we should not have one central galactic government. 
be it authoritarian or democratic. I mean, why have it, right? And Amidala, even though she's she's the smartest person in the room, I guess, smarter than anyone, uh, she does nothing about it. I mean, she could have the idea of, you know, let's break the government then. If it, if it can be corrupted, the central government, and then, then rule the whole galaxy, how about we just break it or put more, at least put more checks and balances on it? Right. This is not something that is being discussed, even though there were, again, interesting ideas. One of the ideas was that when they when she talks on the balcony with Anakin, this funny conversation, I love you, I love you more and so on, so on, so on. Anakin was supposed to leave. And then the guy from uh, uh, from uh, from the separatists, some person from the separatists was supposed to show up to talk to her, to demonstrate that she already knows that there is a problem and we have to do something about it. Right. There is one of the deleted scenes in which um, in which uh, Organa is talking to Amidala, also lacking in the uh, third movie, uh, where we have also the seeds of the resistance being shown. Right, so you could you could actually, you know, indicate that um, that the discussion about political reality is uh, more nuanced uh, than it already is in uh, in one to three compared to four, five, six. Yes, but uh, on the other hand, we um, we also see in four, five, six, four, five, six, and you talk about it, um, although not politically, we do see some nuances um, to what authoritarian governments and central planning can leave, right? Uh, so we see it more economically than politically. Um, mm -hmm. You 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 mean uh, you mean uh, uh, in uh... In four, five, six. Oh, when already the empire is established, right? And then, then yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. One, one of one of the things is this uh, is something I already mentioned: the deleted scene about nationalizing the resources. I mean, it, it clearly indicates that the empire is less becoming less and less efficient. And that's the general rule: as the government is becoming less and less efficient in doing. Uh, either good tasks or already bad tasks, well, they search for another source of funding and uh, they expropriate people from their funds and then they expropriate people from what they already have. And the absolute government, the, the absolute hunger for power ends up with the fact that, you know, the, the, the land is being expropriated. That's the final stage when you just take away land from the people. And um, this is a perfect demonstration in, uh, and unfortunately in, in, the, in the deleted scene. Then another one is is um, how the trade is being organized. Clearly, clearly inefficient, uh, inefficient uh, uh, exchange of the goods and services. Uh, you have smugglers, right? Han Solo was a smuggler. I mean, people say that he was only smuggling uh, that from the books or or outside of the movie. We we get the idea that perhaps he was smuggling mostly drugs. Uh, yeah, maybe, but you know, the trade in general was was underground trade. So, uh, so a lot of stuff, um, a lot of stuff, exchanged in um, in the underground. So this indicates to you that there was huge inefficiency in economic action <clears throat> when you need when you need smugglers, the black market for for most goods and for some goods and services at least. Um, then uh, we see that the empire itself is inefficient because they have to hire bounty hunters. To find Han Solo, right, and and then even building the Death Star itself, right. I mean, <clears throat> they are also inefficient in, in making it on time. Well, okay, maybe I'm extending it a little bit. Maybe, you know, maybe the the dates were ridiculous, but uh, but in itself, I mean, think about the first Death Star. Think think about its flaws. I mean, okay, it was planned to be, so we could easily destroy it. We know it from. Rogue One. Okay, I mean, uh, so maybe this this part of my argument is not uh, has been has been um, undermined a little bit, right? Because we are not sure how uh, how uh, I mean, maybe they physically could not build the second Death Star on time. I, maybe it was just ridiculous dates. Mm, but 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 uh, uh, at least one thing indicates problems with efficiency is the fact that. You don't have regular engineers who are schooled and trained in the in the field of the division of labor. You have uh, soldiers and and the army building the weapon, right? Whereas whereas you know it's sort of 
this is the way things look in very inefficient communist or fascist state where the army is doing everything right uh, in in um, in places where the economy is functioning <coughs> uh, smoothly at least to some extent you have you know you have division of labor so even when you have secret projects secret government projects not uh, it's not the soldiers who are working on it but this uh, specialized trained people right so um yeah the, the, these were things i guess which short, sort of show uh the lack of efficiency in uh, in economic action in 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 the empire after the collapse of the old republic so um in your um in your lecture you also gave a example a recipe a recipe how to build a dictatorship um how to transform a democratic system into a dictatorship um and you gave uh, example examples from star wars um so um i would like you to elaborate on that because i think that uh, right now um in fact you can see it in almost any uh, any time but uh, i feel that uh, right now we see um, some government overreach, not only in Europe, also in, in the whole world, where, where we see those uh, things that you have been describing very clearly. Um, you've already been talking about uh, finding a common enemy or even inventing one, uh, which happens in democracies. Um Yeah, I mean, uh, the recipe that I uh, <clears throat> that I wanted to present was to uh, sort of a little bit like a joke, right? Recipe for a dictatorship. But the, <laughs> the, the steps that I talk about, uh, how bureaucracy is is being expanded, and when there's inefficiency of bureaucracy, you expand bureaucracy even further. That's the funny part, right? When uh, when the authoritarian party comes to uh, to the power, they say, you know, democracy. You have too much bureaucracy in democracy, and then they introduce even more bureaucracy because when um, when you expand government power, someone has to do it, right? So you need more officials to do it. If you need more officials, you need to hire them in specific bureaus, right? Okay, you're not calling them bureaus. It's not bureaucracy. You can call it whatever, commissions and so on and so on. But the fact is that in the public sector, you employ more people. As you employ more people, you need to govern them and make rules of what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to reach certain goals, how you, for example, promote them, how you sack them. Uh, uh, how you pay them and you pay them for what. I mean, this is, and this is all the expansion of bureaucracy, something you just cannot get rid of when you have expanding government. Um, at the same time, I, I talk about this, uh, um, uh, this Schmittian idea of having enemies in society, which, which expands government's power. And um, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, uh, a little bit, because I find this very important, especially today. Then um, about the fools in the government, in, in democratic institutions that are actually supporting the ideas with, without reflection. Uh, then destruction of the balance of power, taking over of judges, taking over of all branches of government, which are supposed to be outside of the parties, of political parties' influence. Uh, And then um, it, cre it creates certain incentives for the people to stay within the government and not to overthrow it. So let me let me uh, now expand a little bit about a little bit about those enemies. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> sorry, one of the um, a true th a true threat that I see right now. Um, it's slightly different than it was in uh, the 30s, the 40s, and so on, so on. We have to realize uh, that um, political one one rule that we already know about how government is, is getting it, uh, its support from the uh, from the public is that uh, uh, people actually have to passively support it. Right. They, and they have to be like Etienne de la Boitie told us, you know, people have to be in favor of the government in some way. And how what do you make of it? Like how people are <clears throat> are supporting their government? I mean, you have to reach them somehow. Or if things go good, I mean, everyone's happy. Nothing bad is happening. Everyone's sort of, you know, in good circumstances, your conditions are not wonderful, but they are better than they were yesterday. 
nobody wants to overthrow the government or nobody wants to destroy the system, right? Things get problematic when you have a crisis, when people are not feeling better or they lose their jobs or, or something bad is happening with the economy. Then the government, you know, has to sort of expand its power or the newer people come to the government and they need support from the people. So how do you get support from the people, let's say, before the 21st century? Well, you have to reach them. So you have to be king of information. You have to basically, you need to have uh, medias, right? I mean, either when it's, either you have the uh, TV channels, right? And then you reach people when you have uh, television channels. Before that, you had the radio, you know, that in, uh, in uh, Nazi Germany, everyone got the radio for free. Uh, you know why? Not because the government wanted you to have the radio so you can listen to your whatever that was uh, uh, Viralin or, 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 or some good music at that time. Right. The, the government wanted you to have the radio because they run the channels and they tell you, they shape you, right? They demonstrate to you how the reality looks. I mean, just think about it. If you don't have the media, any type of media, you're in your home and what you see, you know, the, the, the shelves, you see your neighbors and that's it. You have no idea how the world looks like outside of it. Okay. You go to work, you get in touch and so on and so on. But most of the reflection that you have about the modern world, where do you get it from? You get it from the media. And it was present when we had television channels, the main source of information it was present when we had the radio uh, part of that was the reason why the government wanted to have people, wanted the people to have the radio. And but it was the same when we had papers uh, or some forms of small outlets that were given to the people. You know, thank Gutenberg for this, right? So you could actually print out information and influence what people were thinking. You could create the vision of reality. And this creation of the vision of reality could be totally in opposition to what it actually looked like. Um, and especially when you have a crisis and if the crisis is the result of many different factors, which makes the story sophisticated, complex, you know, it's not working for the median voter or for the median, um, uh, uh, median citizen, right? What the median citizen li like, likes is, you know, a simple story with good and bad guys. And this is the way you can control the minds and influence what the people are doing. And it's absolutely crucial in pushing the people to support the government, which is telling their, you know, there is a problem and we have a solution to the problem. You get us, you, you put us in power and we solve your problems. And the outlets, the media outlets, all those channels were always important in pushing for more government power. Now, how things have changed in the, why did I say before 21st century? Because before 21st century, we did not have the internet. So we did not have the um, independent, uh, independent uh, uh, net effects. I mean, the effects, uh, network effects, sorry, network effects, right? And right now with the internet, especially when the with, at first when the internet was developed, you could think that you have destruction of the, of the gatekeepers, you have more competition in terms of media outlets, and those media outlets could reach out to the people and they could make more independent judgment. And that was, you know, the impression, especially in the beginning of the 21st century was that, come on, internet is a great thing. Because of the internet, you reach out to the people and you don't have monopoly of information and it will destroy some of the systems, especially the monopolized political systems. Fair enough. And to some extent it did work and to some extent it does work. So we have some independent media because of this. However, we had this, um, we had this, sort of naive vision that human beings are there and they are ready to listen to the truth and they are ready to make critical uh, analysis on their own and you know reach out certain conclusions. And I don't mean that they have to reach out the same conclusions that I'm reaching. I'm talking about just intellectual uh, sophistication that you know you have a different opinion, someone else has a different opinion, but at least you go a little bit deeper into the things like we're talking right now on this seminar on this on this webinar right everyone has their views we have sort of similar views but we could have different views and we could still engage in some form of intellectual reflection unfortunately the thing is that it's not that 
people were coming out with more reliable sources and reaching out to the people, actually all those people, especially median citizens, they have lots and lots and lots of biases. And unfortunately, demand of the people, to use the economic concept, demand for those um, for those uh, for those biases to be satisfied is so strong. Then where is demand? We have supply, and we have creation of various media outlets on the internet, which are giving up so much disinformation. Uh, they, they create way more, uh, 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 not only misinformation, but they also could create uh, way more confusion, right? Perfect example I, was use, I would use is the vaccination stuff, right? Uh, I mean, the vaccines. I mean, the vaccines, um, okay, I don't, want to, I don't want to sound too aggregate. There are, there are some vaccines that might create problems, whatever. There are some issues you could discuss, for example, flu vaccines, right? I mean, their efficiency is not as big as, as we used to think. There is efficiency, but, you know, we wish it was bigger. It was presented sometimes as bigger. It's not as big and so on. Then there is a question whether you should uh, compel people to vaccinate so on. So, I mean, this is all a legitimate discussion, but there is this side of the people that are against any vaccine, right? Which is basically a crazy idea because vaccines were saving so many people, so many people, people's lives, especially when you have a real threat there and uh, and to just reject all of the vaccines because you know i'm anti-vaccine we had people like this but not before the 21st century because we did not have those media channels that you know created those bubbles and those network effects and then it started with the internet i could give other examples which other people would find even more controversial and would disagree with me because they would say oh you're wrong on this but you get the idea that it creates some forms of bubbles when you when you actually attract people that did not have a connection, you know, they did not have a connection because the only way they connected with the external world was the television, and you had three channels on the television, so it was not that anyone could start it and reach out to thousands of people. Right now, anyone can do it on the internet. It's a good thing, but it has a downside because. Some of the people are not apparently interested in critical thinking. They are just interested in, in satisfying their own biases. And then what's another consequence for this? If people are interested in, in biases, people are also emotional. People are also tribal. And then when you have the connection of the three, bias, tribal, and emotional, and you put it on into the social media, it's a recipe for a disaster. It's a basically a recipe for the disaster. So right now, even though we will not have a sort of a similar taking over of, uh, of the media by the government and then introduction of the authoritarianship, all you have to do is actually smartly trigger people. And there is a, that's a good term, trigger, right? You just have to trigger people, right? You just trigger them. You just make them more tribal. You, you just create, what is it? 160 characters, right? Or it's, it's more right now on Twitter, right? You just, I mean, think about Twitter. It's, it's a crazy place. It's, it's a really crazy place, right? Because actually I find a lot of valuable stuff on Twitter uh, because I, I, I think that it's a great area, for example, of communicating new research where you don't have, you don't want to waste too much, car too many characters. You just have to be specific, summarize and say, okay, this paper is interesting. Uh, and and then it's it's uh, you have it linked, right? So it, it works perfectly. Unfortunately, many people are not using it for this purpose. They use it to trigger themselves, attack other people, and insult other people. I mean, it's it's a concert of insults, right? It's, it's a huge pot of insults, insulting people, and so on, so on. And then, of course, when you have a war of insults, you know, Noam Chomsky is was perfectly correct in saying that you know during war, the more extreme people are getting on top. Because the more radical you are, the bigger chances you have with winning the war, right? So similarly in this case, and you have this, you know, this, this thing that people are grouping in tribes, we have a real threat of a civil discourse uh, where people are not really eager and interested in engaging in civil discourse. They are more interested in just insulting each other. It's all online, but it's reshaping right now a uh, real world uh, around us. And you could actually see this craziness in universities in the United States. 
right? Where, 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 where someone is just saying, I mean, this person wrote something on Twitter. We have to cancel that person and throw that person out, sign petition and get rid of him. I mean, it's impossible 20 years ago. Right? It would never, ever happen. And I think that's the real threat when you have the expansion of the government power and, uh, and not only the government power, but also sort of creation of, uh, uh, of these soft, uh, soft ways of uh, reshaping society by, uh, by actually grouping people into those bubbles and then making them angry, making more tribal, and then attacking other tribes. I mean, it's really dangerous. Jonathan Haidt, who is a social psychologist, is dealing with this phenomenon, and he says that's a real threat. Right? He's really concerned about possible social collapse and, and for people becoming more and more poles apart. And uh, to, to be honest, I don't know, I don't know how to handle, handle it either. But I, but I find it dangerous because when you have these um, angry uh, uh, peoples in the bubbles, it's also very easy to expand government power because the government is coming in and saying, yes, you're right, there is such a problem. Let me Simple solve it. solution. Okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> so we have we have a question. Um, how would you convince someone to watch Star Wars who hasn't yet? I guess a statistical person. <laughs> uh, hmm. That's a smart question. Uh, how would I convince the person? Like the um... well. <clears throat> Okay, with four, five, six, I guess, because this is, I find it uh, cinematically the best one. I guess I would say that um, it's really worth watching because it's a universal hero's journey. It's the story of, it's a universal story that you will find on and on and on and on through the history of literature and history of the movies. Right. There is this book, uh, I think it's called Hero's Journey by Campbell and uh, George Lucas read it and was really inspired by it. Uh, and then when he created Star Wars, he, he, the whole idea of, of having the hero and then the hero is, is evolving, doesn't want to, doesn't want to engage in the, in, uh, in the fight. I mean, he, he does not want to join the journey, but then he is dragged into the journey and then he evolves and then he meets various people who are archetypes. You have all this present in the story of humankind, in, in, in myths and so on. And all George Lucas is doing is, is, is basically taking this idea, putting it into the movie and then adding, well, to be honest, ridiculous stuff, right? Cowboys, knights, space cowboys, space knights, right? I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's sort of like, it's very cheap, right? You just put as much, as many elements of the pop culture as you can, as you can. But this is how it, this, this is why it works, you know, because it has so many references uh, um, uh, into other works. Um, Lucas was directly inspired by... Uh, uh, Kurosawa, right? You can, I mean, you can clearly even have similar scenes from Kurosawa um, that is there. Uh, then there are uh, there are some war movies from uh, was it from the sixties, I guess, uh, which is which are directly New Hope. So a lot of stuff in there is actually taken from other already tried uh, uh, tried elements, and they worked. So he basically took them out, put them in. And it, it, be, it became successful. And as a proof for this is, of course, a really, really good series, uh, Mandalorian, right? Mandalorian is really, is, is really good. I encourage you to watch it. And the reason why it's good is because it's used the same recipe as 4, 5, 6 did. And Lucas didn't use this recipe in 1, 2, 3, and even more, seven, eight, nine, they also didn't use this recipe. And the recipe is simple. You just take the story of the long character who is restrained, who, who is not engaging in the journey, and then he's dragged or she's dragged, could be her, of course. She's dragged into the story 
and then is developing through the story and then has to somehow help the kid or help uh, uh, help another person, help weaker persons and then save the day, right? I mean, uh, so, and, and the way it's being done, it's done using classic archetypes and then it's done uh, uh, in a smooth way, right? In an engaging way with good dialogue. So I would convince it uh, I would I would try convincing it this way, or maybe it's too it's too advanced, or uh, all right, it's, maybe it's too long a little bit. But uh, I would say that we've seen it many times, and this time it's done really nicely, so it's worth watching. So we have another question: uh, Who are the top three libertarian characters? So libertarian personalities. Well, that's easy. Uh... Of course, it has to run in Skywalker family. So it was Luke. No competition. Definitely Luke. Um, then... Uh, okay, now I have to think about it. So I would say... Okay, uh, it has to be Han, Han Solo, I guess. Um, an agorist yeah 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 it has to be Han Solo and Luke and then with the third one I would have I guess I would have problems um, because it, it would not would not be but I think I'm so inclined to put Amidala in I, I, I mean basically she's my favorite character in from one to three even though I have many reservation about what she did i mean she could really done differently many things she should have reacted differently towards anakin but you know i mean she she was totally in love with him so uh, you can understand that she could she could not resist it i mean this is how we are as human beings we sometimes cannot resist and we care for people who do not really deserve to be cared for Mm, but but I would I would definitely include her in. I would not include any Jedi because of the mistakes that they committed from one in one to three, even Obi Wan. Right? I mean, it's just I would not do it. I have reservations with including Amidala because she was the uh, the politician, right? But if we think that Ron Paul was uh, is libertarian, he was still somehow connected to the state, then we could easily say that Amidala was also libertarian. So. So I think those three, maybe I missed someone, maybe I made a mistake, but I think those three uh, would be the ones. And it would be hard to find a fourth person that could compete for the spot. So. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, Amidala, she at least um, has shown that she has a concept of liberty. So she has a concept of the rule of law and uh, um, of democratic processes, which I which I think are connected to liberty and to the liberal philosophy. Um, so there is another question, and I think it's a good one um, on two levels because you can understand the question in different ways. Um, are there any characters in the film that you can connect with people from the real life? So the way I understand the question, you can understand it two two ways. Now, can you connect? the personalities with some historical persons um but you could also ask um do you can you connect uh, the personalities with some um persons uh, from current history from current events well um well you know palpatine is obviously hitler right uh, you know, but um, others. I don't. I don't think you could. I wouldn't even try. You know, because I mean, we're talking about politicians here, and uh, and many of of the negative characters. Like, I don't want to do it to reward politicians. Maybe they're still alive and they're listening to it. Ha <laughs> <laughs> uh, But But even take the other side. We have positive characters. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, and then I, I, I wouldn't think that, uh, I, I would not like to appreciate them too much, right? Uh, except for Ron Paul, perhaps. 
I would say uh, that he's sort of like our Amidala and even better, right? Um, because as you say, he, he has the concept of liberty and, and it's a really rare thing uh, for a politician to apply this concept so broadly and universally as he does, as he does. because politicians are using the rhetoric of, of freedom, equality, and so on and so on. But he has this really thought through and uh, he applies it to every single circumstances, every single circumstance he tries, he could apply it. And, uh, and he has some background philosophical knowledge. Uh, so I guess I would say that, um, yeah, um, if, if anyone is, if I would have to make any comparison, I would say uh, Ron Paul is close to Amidala, but he's even better because if she had the same knowledge as he did, well, things might have turned out differently. <laughs> Again. So we were talking. We were talking about how um, the internet, uh, how the media uh, shapes today uh, today's world, and uh, how we create bubbles. Um, but we at SFL, um, we uh, believe in high exterior of social change, so that. Um, ideas uh, first have to be transported uh, into po into politics, and then they get um, actually realized uh, through politicians. And uh, in today's world, one of the ideas that is coming back very strongly, um, which is commonly called protectionism, uh, and what I actually think is um, some sort of uh, neo neo mercantilism. Um, is uh, for me personally the biggest danger um, of uh, the political order and the uh, liberal libertarian free market order, um, and in that in that sense, uh, Star Wars also is showing, as, as you already mentioned, that it starts with trade. Um, the the problems the problem uh, in Star Wars they start with trade. Uh, how can we as libertarians fight against um, or perhaps compete in the free market of ideas? I, I really hope that it's not a war yet um, with the ideas of mercantilism and with protectionism. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think that's the biggest threat because so far the tendencies okay there, there, there are some changes in the recent years and there is some problem with us and china right now but the international trade seems to intensify from year to year and from decade to decade in the last 50 years after second world war more and more countries are engaged in trading and uh I'm not that much afraid about mercantilism in, in the sense of trade mercantilism winning over. At least I hope so. And um, But you raise a really good point about it being present in social thinking. And this is one of the interesting elements is that we don't really have much mercantilist policies implemented, at least compared to what was going on 30, 40, 50 years ago. But it's, at the same time, you have this sentiment uh, in the general population that somehow mercantilist policies are great because you can support your local businesses and then it would you know, make the economy great again. <laughs> uh, or something of the sort, like and um, and and I not only I mean United States, but it's also in Poland and Western Europe and so on and so on. And you have all those people saying, "Yeah, we need more mercantilism." And uh, if, I mean, the paradox is that you put those people in one room and they would nod. All of them would nod. I mean, you could have Americans, uh, Chinese, Poles, and then Western Europeans and some Africans and some Americans from Central America and then from you know, Southern America. They would. They, they would talk to each other. They would say, yeah, yeah, we need more mercantilism, right? So that, would, that would be the paradox, right? I mean, you know, then they wouldn't even realize they would be all hurting each other. It would be like, you know, like, like a, um, 
that would be like a uh, uh, like a race in 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 sadomasochism, right? I mean, I mean, I'm gonna hit you. I'm gonna hit you harder, right? Um, but I I think so. How do we fight it? Um, I think we always need two types of arguments, or we need two sides of the argument. Uh, in order to win anything. One side is the intellectual side. I would call it a purely rational side in which you're making a case and you're demonstrating, now look, this doesn't make sense because it will hurt you, right? It will not be beneficial to you. But then there is a second side, which I would call the emotional side. And it's sometimes even more important than, uh, than the rational side. And I would say there is a two-step two approach in this emotional side. One is, is to engage a person in a friendly uh, manner. Uh, I mean, when you talk to someone, don't confront the person immediately. Um, I'm guilty of it myself. I confront people all the time, right? Even though I read the book, How to Make Friends, right? I mean, I, but I By never... Dale Carnegie. <laughs> And then and, and I always fail. I always forget about it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, try engaging with the person, especially in, in person, when you do it in person. It's even more difficult on the social media. You don't have the time and you want to correct the word right away, right? But, you know, engage with the person in a friendly manner <clears throat> so, uh, so that the person does not perceive you as your enemy. Right? I mean, say that, say some nice start with something nice and then emphasize the uh, the common points and so on and so on so that would be the one thing and then uh making it more specific as you said uh making more specific meaning referring to the problem you mentioned so the hostility between the groups and especially hostility between the nations and societies on the international level so how do you approach this well human beings have tribal mentality but this tribal mentality manifests itself on two levels often conflicting levels one level is your own tribe that you choose to some extent the own tribe that you live with right so it could be your football club fan or it could be your um, uh, profession or it could be your family or it could be your town, it could be your nation. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but there is a potential, especially when there is a conflict, to initiate hostility towards other groups of the sort, and especially the groups of um, uh, other, other nations, right? right? But at the same time, there is some tribal element in all of us recognizing that we are part of one species human beings, right? So when you think about this, um, during wars, during conflicts, during pandemics also, you see this tribalism manifest itself on two elements. One element is when you have hostility, right? People are saying, oh, this is a China virus. Oh, this is your United States virus or something, right? To, to use the modern reflection. But at the same time, People could be emotional and sentimental about the fact that we have, we are part of the same species and we have common interests, right? And you feel empathy. Oh my, people actually, life itself has empathy built into it, even intraspecies, right? We feel empathy for animals or we can feel empathy for animals. We can, we can, uh, uh, we can sort of put ourselves into the position of animals, right? People can be moved by the fact what the dog did to some other dog, when the dog saves a dog or, or when the monkey saves someone and so on. So you can, actually, you, you can actually have some form of connection. So the same thing, you could have a connection with people from other groups and from other nations. So this is the part of the, the emotional side of the argument I would also emphasize is the fact that, uh, you know, these are also people. It's, it's not just a rational analysis that tells you, you know, it's great to have division of labor 
and other nations are doing other things and we trade with them and, 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 and this is beneficial. Oh yeah, sure, this is a rational part of the argument. But another emotional part of the argument is that there, there is only one race, it's a human race. And we have common interests and people are not different. I mean, essentially, they are not that much different. They want to, care, they, they want to take care of themselves and their families and they want to mind their own business within some boundaries, right? Of course, then you have, okay, but how do you mind your own business? What are the, what actually is your business? What is not? And so on and so on. I, you cannot just, you know, of course I'm simplifying, but on the rhetorical level, it's important to appeal to the, you know, by some of the biological instincts that we have, they do not have to manifest themselves in those aggressive hostile channels. Right. So when we have this tribal element of thinking, oh, I'm part of this town, I'm part of this nation, we also have this uh, the same type of feeling that we have. We can have the feeling for the broader group, right? For example, for humanity in general, right? When you think about humans, what we were doing for the last two thousand years in terms of technological development, development, this is not just one one nation that did, uh, did all this, right? It's people across the globe from all the places around the world did this, and then when we colonize space in in, in some in some time will be the same story it will be human achievement it will not be just one nation's achievement yes and the empathy towards towards animal animals and other species actually makes me um very um optimistic about uh, something that kind of brings us back to star wars which is intragalactic trade which might happen in the future right uh, there will ag there will again be um a prob the problem of mercantilism and protectionism between uh, between the earth and other um, solar systems or other um other uh, galactic systems so um, that makes me actually a little bit more optimistic about that um, I would like to uh, talk um, about um, uh, protectionism uh, a little more because um, it seems to me that there are not many things on which uh, economists agree on. Um, there are some some uh, principles. So, so for years it was uh, that price controls, for example, like the minimum wage, um, are uh, detrimental or are harmful for the um, economy um, now today we don't we don't have this kind of agreement anymore among economists um, however the one thing the one thing that I think connects uh, really um, the vast majority is that um, the economy is not a, a zero-sum game um, and that um, trade um, and uh, exchange of goods uh, is uh, good for both sides, uh, so that free trade um, brings us further into into wealth, into um, into development, innovations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we know this, and uh, there is some kind some kind of uh, agreement among the scientists that that deal with uh, economy, right? Economists. Um, but this idea developed anyways. Why did that happen and how did that happen? What did we do wrong? What did you do wrong? Like you are an economist. I'm not. I'm, I'm a law student. So <laughs> uh, um, but you mean but you mean specifically about the minimum wage law or or that um, that there is in general more disagreement with between the economies? That's your point? Uh, no, no. I, I mean, actually, when it comes to minimum wage laws, I find it actually quite easy to understand. I, I mean, specifically protectionism, uh, why um, the political reality is so different um, from the scientific reality. Um, with, uh, with the case of protectionism, I would say that's easy. With protectionism, it's simple. It's uh, uh, interest groups, lobbies and interest groups. And if you take such people as uh, Brad DeLong, um, uh, Paul Krugman, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Paul Samuelson. I mean, these are not 
libertarians <laughs> they're not like uh you know fighting libertarians or liberty warriors or anything of the sort i wouldn't say they are total free traders that under all circumstances they would say you know always free trade no reservations about capital movements or trading and so on and so on but in general they would say that it's beneficial and uh, most most of the time when you introduce tariffs is just lobbies and interest groups. So as you said, as you mentioned in the beginning of your question, uh, the, um, the, 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 the idea of free trade as an, as an equilibrated idea is alive and well in the economic profession. So there is only one explanation why we don't have it in political reality at full. Is this because apparently someone wants to deny it, right? That someone, uh, someone wants to, um, you know, uh, rent seek as public choice theory says, right? They just want to reach out for low hanging fruit, which is introduction of some tariffs. And this is what happened in George Bush junior era this is what happened in trump's uh, uh donald trump's era president trump's right you have the introduction of some of the protectionist elements because it benefits some special interest groups and this is the unfortunate reality that you have um sometimes uh, the crisis element is being used um I mean, even 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 right now, right during pandemic, similar stuff is happening. You have you have some interest groups going into action, fighting for their own additional streams of money. So uh, I guess, unfortunately, I have to fall for a very very simplistic explanation, which is which is basically that you have. I don't like the word conspiracy. <laughs> But because well, sounds bizarre, but it's a little bit sort of like a conspiracy against the taxpayer that um, you have this fight uh, to get the extra funds, and the best way is to you know harm competitors, and it happens often. Uh, just you want to harm your competitors, and 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 then you you try to do it through government regulation, and then. You might even want to ask the government to do it, and then you could have a good rhetorical justification to do it. You know, we just have to do it. Yeah, but so so sort of like sounds very simplistic, but uh, in this case, it sounds quite right to me. So as my last question, um, I would like to ask you, because I think that you have to have a positive message, and with positive, I actually mean... Um, optimistic message um, as uh, you know some answer to your uh, problems the problems of your political philosophy um, so we as libertarians um, why do you think why do you think we can look positively uh, into the world maybe um, I would like you to to seek uh, for hope um, for uh, reasons for hope for libertarians, for us freedom-loving individuals? <clears throat> mm. Overall, as human beings, the big... If you were to narrate the story of human species in the last 100,000 years, it would be that human beings is a very, very special species that experiments with various forms of action and uh, tries to introduce with different successes, and sometimes it's really hard to introduce, competing ideas into the sphere. And we try to do things differently in most fields. And um, I guess uh, that this applies also to broader, broader range of what is happening in the political sphere and not only this. So I think that 
the most important things that will happen probably in the future that will start to happen this century and then will accelerate even further in the next century and then the next century is revolution in energy, a revolution in the ways of how people work, and then revolution in space travel. So why is the why why is that important? First of all, the revolution in energy. I don't know how fast it will happen, but when it happens, it destroys geopolitical order of the world. A lot of stuff, not everything. Some people have obsessions. Uh, they think that it, everything is around those geopolitical circles in, on the planet. Uh, sort of like biased view again. But we cannot deny the fact that uh, natural resource, resources play a significant role. And especially, or actually natural forms of energy that we have play a significant role in, uh, in what is happening um, in terms of political order, right? Where the pipes are, where the oil is, where the gas is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When we have revolution in energy and more independent sources of energy are created, the resources that you can actually capture and get from varying competing places, it will hurt monopolistic powers of many governments. It will not destroy them, of course, it will not change much for some governments, but it will already reshape the, uh, the geopolitical structure of the world. That's one thing. <clears throat> uh, then the second revolution is already happening right now, very inefficiently, and we'll get back to normal life soon, but uh, staying home, right? Work, staying home work. That is the way you communicate with the people, you can do it online, and then more and more work could be done online. Not everything is possible, but when you think about potential innovations, you know, when a phone, and video conferences were invented, uh, people were thinking, now we have video conferences. Now people will stop traveling and will stop having all those management meetings and meetings in general, because what, you can, you can just, you know, meet online. Uh, that's not that easy, because as we know, the experience by being online is not the same as being in the same room. So there is room for improvement there and for innovation. <clears throat> One of the possible innovations is 3D holograms. And not only 3D holograms, but 3D sound with special speakers that you have in your room. And then when we introduce this, you can recreate office space without being in place. So now think, think how it changes also the existing uh, reality because then you can mobilize people to become the part of the labor force anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, right? No boundaries. I mean, when you run the company in the United States, you don't have to invite actually workers, smart engineers from India. Uh, you could actually do it fully online and truly online. <clears throat> but then again, as I said, you need lots of lots of innovations in this field. And then when this happens, Right, you have those two things. And then the third element, which will probably start to happen this century and then go on in the next century is colonizing the space and other planets. I mean, think about this, other planets colonize, how do you colonize them? And it's very possible that private companies will do it. So you colonize the planet and then you have to start society there. How do you do it? So you could actually have competition and governance and you can actually have the first time in history, probably, creation of states that are based on social contract and not on robbery, right? So as you add those three elements together, all of those things will reshape how the government has to be run. And, they, and, and, and there is a potential for the government to lose its power in all the fields because of this. 
because we could travel to different planets, because we could colonize different planets, because it will not be easy to monopolize energy and the resources that are necessary to run the economy. And then the third element is that you can actually <clears throat> easily do lots of lots of things by not living in the specific place, which is your tax city, right? Because then when you add those things together, the government is just reduced to an unpleasant landowner or actually landlord, not landowner, landlord. You don't like it, you can just move. Because right now, moving is problematic. Uh, you cannot do easily a walk away. I mean, you can, but walk away is expensive. You leave your family, right? You leave the city that you like. It's not easy to find a job and so on, so on. Might be problematic to learn the language. And as humanity is being developed, walk away is getting cheaper and cheaper. And the cheaper walks away, and the cheaper the, uh, the cheaper the option of walk away is getting, the broader field for reduction of inefficiency of the government, because then there is a huge competitive pressure on the government to change and to adjust, because otherwise the government will experience walkaways, right? Much like it happened in the Eastern Germany when people just, you know, could just leave. I mean, I'm not staying in Eastern Germany, I'm going to Western Germany. Of course, there has, there can be a, a blowback, right? The government might try to stop it and probably will try to stop it to some extent. But overall, walk away will get cheaper and cheaper. People will get more and more alternatives, more and more options. And the more options we have, the cheaper those options they become, the bigger the competitive pressure on the government to adjust and become more efficient. And on some level, we will be closer to Star Wars, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to the stars. But actually, I would say... Let's hope we are not closer to Star yes. Wars. Let's let's hope we are closer to Star Trek. <laughs> yes. Right? Let's 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 move towards Star Trek, right? I mean this is two different visions. Star Wars is showing us the worst things in us are in Star Wars <clears throat> and the best things in us are in Star Trek, right? So they are uh, these are complementary complementary shows actually because one is uh, focusing on the positive aspects of humanity and another one is focusing on the negative, suggesting that we are not that much different in our vanities and vices. All right. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, for uh, for you guys uh, who will be watching this, uh, you can uh, you can uh, find the book um, either if you're Polish uh, on the. Um, on the side of the Mises Institute, the Polish Mises Institute. You can find the book on uh, Amazon if you find it interesting. Um, and I'd like to uh, like to invite you. you also uh, for uh, the lecture on uh, the next Monday, um, in which we will have an author and uh, scholar uh, whose book was actually published in Polish uh, by the uh, Polish Mises Institute by you guys. Uh, we will have um, Deidre McCloskey uh, with uh, the topic uh, how the liberal idea enriched the world. So you are of course also invited and thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. It was really fun. I enjoyed it. And actually there is McCloskey in my book. So she appears there. Uh, when I talk about the entrepreneurs and bourgeoisie who are important for for social development, uh, exactly her point and the point she will make probably during the, the seminar. Thank you uh, for the invitation and thank you to all the listeners and, and everyone.